So where does time actually go? I mean, one minute you're riding your bike to school, starting your first job, going to your first nightclub, hopefully in that order, and next minute you're in your mid-40s. I mean, why did childhood take so long to get through and then suddenly everything is travelling at warp speed? And have you noticed these days that often when you ask somebody how they are, they answer with busy, with a knowing nod. Now, I don't even know what that means, but we seem to wear it like a badge of honour. Have we really just set up these series of expectations for ourselves? And who's judging us? Are other people judging us or are we just judging ourselves? And how did we even get here? Now, for me, I think we may have lost sight of where it all started. So let me now take you back in time to a time where days were longer, life was simpler, things were more exciting. So I'm going to take you back to your childhood, or should I say, to once upon a time. I mean, we all loved those stories, didn't we? And every generation since has loved those stories. Generations across the eras have read them to the next generation. So why? If we look at cultures around the world, every culture reads stories. And they're more than just myths, legends and fables. They are the oral textbooks of the culture, designed to impart wisdom, spirituality and knowledge to the next generation. So this got me thinking, what are they trying to tell us? So to work that out, I think we need to go to the end of the story, to happily ever after. I mean, isn't that what we all want? The secret to happiness? But what if we were already given the map to happiness, but life got in the way and we forgot what we learned? So, my contention today is that fairy tales are the map to happiness. Now, some of you are probably rolling your eyes a little bit and smirking at me, but bear with me, because let's have a look at this. So, fairy tales are all fairly generally recognisable because they contain the same elements. We've got two main characters. We've got the princess or heroine, and we've got the evil queen or evil stepmother or pretty much anything with evil in the title. And they all end the same way. So, let me start, though, by telling you what I don't think the messages are in fairy tales. Number one, it's not about finding a handsome prince. Sorry, girls. Um, I mean, he really was just a minor character in all of the fairy tales. He was the outcome of happiness, not the source. And secondly, it's not about being a princess. I mean, at the time when fairy tales were written, it was probably the coolest job in the land. But nowadays, there are so many things that we can be. So the princess really is an ideology, not an actual aspiration. So we all started in the same place, wanting to live happily ever after. But what my concern is these days is we're all starting to shift towards being the evil queen, and maybe we're travelling down the path to happily never after. So let's have a look at the elements from fairy tales. Does anyone think the world is looking a little bit more miserable these days? I mean, I watch people all the time, and sometimes I think people are just looking more sad, or in reality, they're not looking at all because they've got their heads so far buried in technology, they're not seeing anything. So why did we stop smiling? I think for all of us, sometime in our life, we were told we had to grow up, and that meant we had to become more serious. And for women going into the workforce in the 80s and 90s, they wanted to be taken serious by their male counterparts. And the characteristics of good management in those days was all about control and command. So although it wasn't something that we were comfortable with as women, it was something that we learned, and we tended to perpetuate these learnings because it was conditioned learning and it is going to take generations to change. And the reality is in the decade today, it's not going to cut it. And like the end of the fairy tale, it will probably end up killing you. Now for me, when I first got the job I'm in at the moment, the Chancellor came up to me before I started and said, Narelle, for a CFO, you smile way too much. And I thought, oh my God, maybe he's right. This organisation's a lot bigger than any I've ever worked for. Maybe I need to be more serious. So of course I turn up to work on the first day with this intention to be more serious. 
And by lunchtime, I was absolutely exhausted because I'd just spent four hours trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And the reality is, how can you be your best if you're trying to be someone else? And the good thing is, is that smiling actually has some great benefits. It's got health benefits. It lowers anxiety, it lowers stress, it improves your immune system by increasing your white blood cells. So by smiling more, you might even live longer. You'll also seem more trustworthy because studies have shown if you want to be seen as more credible, all you need to do is smile. Now you think about our characters. Does anyone think the evil queen is actually trustworthy? and it probably doesn't help that she has evil in her title, um, but certainly not, whereas in our princess was seen as very, very different. You'll also be more approachable because studies have shown that people are more willing to engage with people if they smile. Now, you think about coming into, you know, even a conference like this, if you don't know anyone, who are you going to talk to? You're going to be talking to the scowling person in the corner or will you talk to the person who actually is smiling and looks like they want to have a conversation? So you need to have a think about what, how you want to be seen um, in terms of other people. And the good thing is, it is not hard to smile. You don't need a university degree, you don't need a million dollars, everybody is endowed with the ability to smile. So, element number two. The heroine considers others. So, it's actually a good thing if you make other people feel happy. You think about how you feel when you make somebody laugh. It's really nice, isn't it? You feel good, they feel good. And the nicer you are to, uh, to others, the easier you are to be around. And I think that's really important in the workplace as well. If you have a look at our characters, can anyone remember the Evil Queen actually ever having any friends? She had people around her for a short period of time, but only when it, they were going to get something out of it for themselves. So it wasn't really true friendship. If you look at our heroine, she was surrounded by people all the time who were really loyal and helped her right up until the end. Now, if we have a look at literature, literature also tells us that giving to others will make us feel happy. And you're probably thinking, oh God, just another thing that I have to do. But I'm not talking about tangible giving. I'm talking about basic niceties, making people feel comfortable. It's not about making people feel bad to make you feel better, because that's only short term. It's about making other people feel comfortable. You'll know this person in the workforce. They're really smart, they're good at what they do, but they are toxic. They're always miserable, it's always someone else's fault, they're really confrontational, and they're always the victim. And the reality is nobody wants to work with them. They could be so much more if they just considered people around them. But the reality is you can be the best at what you are in the workforce, but if people don't want to work with you, you're not going to go anywhere. Now, I'm not talking about being a pushover either, because the reality is it takes a lot more courage to not be a bullier and an intimidator, and it takes even more courage to show you are vulnerable. And at the end of the day, you should never burn bridges, because I can tell you right now, that person you're mean to today will be the person sitting on your selection panel in 10 years' time for your perfect job, and I'm pretty sure we know how that story's going to end. <coughs> and the good thing is, it's not hard to consider others. You don't need a university degree, you don't need a million dollars, we are all endowed with the ability to consider other people. So element number three, the heroine embraces the simple life. Why do we never think we have enough to be happy? You'll know this voice in your head. When I have X, I'm going to be happy. But the problem is, is these days, once we get X, suddenly we want Y. And if we look at our characters, this is the evil queen down to a T. She wanted world domination. She wanted to be the fairest in the land. She wanted, wanted, wanted. Our princess was different. She was happy hanging out with the animals. She was not looking for anything more than that she had. She was very, very content. And I heard a story recently, which I think is a really good depiction of this. There was a businessman sitting by the seaside watching a fisherman. He said to the fisherman, how many fish did you catch? And he said, oh, just a few. He said, okay, what do you do for the rest of the day? Well, I get up, I catch some fish, I play with my kids, I have a nap with my wife in the afternoon, and then we go out with friends at night and socialise. He said, well, 
I have a PhD in business. I can make you more successful. What you need to do is go out, stay out there longer, catch more fish. Then once you catch more fish, you can buy more boats. Then you can set up your own production company, blah, blah, blah. And the fisherman said, and then what? He said, well, then you can float your company on the stock exchange. You'll become really rich and you can live like a king. And then what? Well, then you can retire to a small fishing village. You can get up in the morning, catch some fish, play with your kids, have a nap with your wife, and go out with your friends. And the fisherman, as you've already guessed, said, isn't that what I do now? So the businessman was trying to help him by giving him his successful elements for a happy life. But the reality is happiness is different to everybody. It's not a one formula fits all. And so, as we know, the good thing is, it's not hard to embrace the simple life. You don't need a university degree, you don't need a million dollars, we are all endowed with the ability to embrace a simple life. Element number four, the heroine always believes. Now, I have a bit of confession to make because I was one of these people who used to watch mothers who dressed their kids up as princesses and I thought, oh my God, they're really not setting them up for the real world. Um, but I think I was the one who actually um, made a mistake in my judgment there. Because in none of our fairy tales was the heroine not treated unjustly. Like if we look at Cinderella, she was basically a slave to her evil stepmother. And if we look at Snow White, she had to clean the house of seven stinky coal miners. And as we all know, it's hard enough cleaning the house for one stinky coal miner. They certainly weren't afraid of hard work and they certainly weren't living in fairyland. But they never really complained, did they? They were proud about what they did. So sometimes we need to look, stop looking for external validation. We all know the self-fulfilling prophecy. If you never think you're going to be happy, you're never going to be happy. And if we look at our characters, our heroine never really did anything to try and change her path. I mean, when the prince found the glass slipper, Cinderella didn't race to the palace demanding to see the prince claiming that she was the rightful owner. No, she sat back and waited because she knew the truth and we know how that story ended. The evil queen, however, resorted to poisoning Snow White to try and get her happy ending, which we know didn't happen. So sometimes trying to force yourself off your path can actually put you onto the wrong path. Now, I'm not saying sit back and just wait for everything to come to you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I think we all need to think about how many dead bodies we're willing to leave in our wake before karma gives us a good kick up the backside. And you know what I'm going to say now. It's not hard to believe. You don't need a university degree. You don't need a million dollars. We are all endowed with the ability to embrace life. So, has anything I told you sound hard? No, and that's why we teach it to children. I mean, read the hundreds of thousands of self-help books out there and they will tell you exactly the same thing. We spend millions of dollars on research only to get the same answers. It's almost like we are too scared to embrace life without a guaranteed outcome. And as we all know, there are only two things guaranteed in life, death and taxes. So let me take you to the end of life. There's a book out at the moment called The Five Regrets of Dying by Australian author Bronnie Ware. Now, Bronnie was a palliative care nurse, so these aren't her regrets of dying. These are the regrets she hears from her patients at their hour of death. And what I'm going to do is then link them back to our elements. So the first regret, I wish I'd let myself be happier. So maybe we should just smile more. The second one, I wish I had have kept in touch with my friends. So maybe we should be considering others more. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I'd embraced maybe a simpler life. And the last two are, I wish I had have um, the courage to express my feelings and I wish I had to live my true life and not the life that others expected of me. So maybe we need to believe in ourselves more. And this is really, really relevant for me because I have one regret in life. When I was in my 20s, a really good friend of mine was diagnosed with terminal cancer and I was living away at the time, but I came home and I saw him shortly before he died. And all I wanted to do was tell him how much I loved him and what a, an amazing friend he was. But I didn't, I choked 
I didn't have the courage to express my feelings and it's haunted me ever since. And he was the glue that kept our group of friends together even though we'd all gone off on separate lives. And so when I started to think about this, I suddenly realised next year he would have been gone 20 years. And the last time our group got together as a whole was about 15 years ago. And I feel ashamed. I feel like I've let him down. And do you know what I blame? I blame time. So, a life here is finite. Start the way you want to finish because we only have one life. And as you drift towards becoming the evil queen, and we know we will, just check yourself, acknowledge it, but don't make excuses for it. The challenge here today is think about where you started and what you learnt and think about where you want to be at the end. This is what's important. Don't let the labyrinth of life set you on the wrong path. Be the hero in your story and that way you may just live happily ever after.